can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And today's guest, I'm going to introduce formally in a second, Scott Becker of Becker's Healthcare. Um, and, you know, Scott, I like to mention past episodes people should check out. And over the past, you know, decades, Scott's been doing this for a long time as well. Um, I have had some really interesting guests on. I had a couple weeks ago, the co-founder of Pixar. Um, and so I suggest people check that episode out. Uh, when it comes out, he's talking about Steve Jobs and George Lucas and kind of founding of the original Pixar. It was really interesting. Um, other past guests include um, Julie Clark, who started Baby Einstein. Uh, she talked about how she grew it from five employees to $20 million in a very short period of time and sold it to Disney. But the most impressive part was she um, calls herself the cancer assassin. She, uh, beat cancer twice and just hearing about her journey. Um, you know, sometimes we don't hear about the personal struggles in tough points along with building a company, which can, uh, which is always there and it's always tough. So check out more episodes at inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by rise 25. We help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And what I, for me, as, as Scott knows, um, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships, profile them, profile what they're doing and uh, what their company is doing and shout it from the rooftop. So if you've thought about doing one, you could email us and go to rise25.com. Today, today's guest, Scott Becker, has been running Becker's Healthcare for over 30 years and is a partner of McGuire Woods. And um, I'm going to let Scott talk a little bit about because Becker's Healthcare is this uh, amazing company and they have so many different moving pieces from the digital pieces to the events pieces. Past speakers of the conferences include George Bush, Hillary Clinton, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and so many more. Uh, Scott, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thank you so much. And what a privilege to get to visit with you. Again, Scott Becker, founder, publisher of Becker's Healthcare, which those that are not in healthcare, uh, publication for hospitals, health systems, and we've got a few other core verticals uh, and been around for 30 plus years. I'm also a lawyer, you know, but with the, it's so embarrassing is having gone to Harvard, I have to say it within 30 seconds of being on any discussion. Harvard Law School graduate, so embarrassing, I apologize. And also, um, you know, partnered at a law firm called McGuire Woods, which is a large AMLA firm, and also served on the board of directors for a long time, served as the national chair of our healthcare practice for a long time. And a lot of my life is revolved around whether law or in, in the media business around healthcare. And so we follow the COVID, you know, the Delta variant, all those things very, very close to the impact on hospitals and health systems, as well as in the live conference business. Uh, uh, so uh, separately, you've got some other media properties around private equity and business and digital properties and so forth. So Jeremy, just a pleasure to get to visit with you today. Thank you. I, I'm looking forward to digging in deep on this uh, amazing um, offshoot from lawyer to um, Becker's healthcare. But I want to start back in, you know, you mentioned the Harvard days. And I didn't know this until about 10 minutes ago that um, you have an interesting connection um, when you were at Harvard. So, yeah, so I an inch, yes, I, I was a teaching assistant and taught moot court. And that's sort of the, the legal competition for writing and presenting and so forth. And as a third year law student, they use third years to help teach and guide and advise. And so of the 12 students I had, two of them were a, um, you know, were one was the son of a world famous judge uh, or, or Richard Posner, uh, the son, Eric Posner. And the other one that was in my class out of the 12 was a, a gentleman, um, Barack Obama, President Obama. And so I had this I had this this wonderful thing of having 12 students in the class and Eric Posner and Barack. You know, I was this, you know, young University of Illinois graduate who went to Harvard Law School and Eric and Barack were literally you know, you in any group you're in, there are people that are much better than the other people. And Eric and Barack were those people. And so 
I would try and explain things to the class about legal writing or about presenting and so forth. And we would constantly get the situation where Barack or Eric would say, and they would do it in the nicest, most politically appropriate way. I think what Scott, I think what Mr. Becker is trying to say is this. And, and like, as, as opposed to being offended, they handled it so well and were so correct and so right on. They, they clearly should have been teaching the class, not myself, that I would have to say, that's exactly right. That's what I meant. And, and the class became almost like, in my own mind, like a Saturday Night Live skit where I would be like Chris Farley and they would be explaining things. <laughs> and I'd be like, that's right. That's right. And they, and they were, you know, and they were right on. And, and, and Brack... You know, and whether I agree with his politics or not, and some of them I agree with, some I don't agree with, but it was, you know, literally had this tremendous way about him and, and truly a pleasure of a person and crazily bright. And and the only reason I always mention Eric Posner in the same sentence, because Eric was also is is, you know, his dad is this famous judge, Richard Posner, and Eric is now a law professor someplace and also crazily, crazily bright. And they would literally, you know, I it, they would literally take over the class that I was supposedly teaching or advising on and so forth. And they were just like gifted in every single way. And, and, you know, Brock is a gifted, gifted, whether agree this politics or not, just a gifted, gifted person and and a pleasure to be around as a person. That is, that is wild. I love that. Talk about the transition from lawyer. I mean, you're still, still a lawyer, but to the um, kind of digital and events uh, that we know of as Becker's healthcare. Sure. So when I was a young, young lawyer, and there's a whole history to this, you know, in the, in the, um, there, there were two or three things that came into this. As, as a young lawyer, you learn early on that you ultimately are far better off in terms of having control of your life if you are, if you've brought clients into the firm, if you're part of the fabric of bringing clients in versus versus not and that's you're not a rainmaker like someone you're who's a, a rainmaker rain versus not and so what yeah. happens in law firms is you, you're very valuable in law firms if you're a rainmaker you're also crazily valuable in law firms if you manage lots of people there, there's different ways to be very valuable there's three sort of core ways you're just so great at what you do you're a rainmaker or you manage tons of people early on in my career when i was at huge huge firm the people that did not have some control of their lives, because they didn't manage lots of business, or they didn't bring in lots of business, were treated so poorly that I became very motivated very early to build a legal practice, to build a business where ultimately I became a rainmaker and a manager. And, and as part of doing that, I started sort of doing these small conferences and newsletters around a sector in healthcare. And that was just, it was a very small effort. It's really aimed at, at marketing in my law practice. And that was the sort of genesis of Becker's Healthcare, which started really 30 years ago now. And now Becker's Healthcare became a very valuable media property. It really became much more valuable 12, 15 years after I started it, when I started hiring people full time in that business and grew that business into a serious business. And that business now it covers and it's one of the most widely read newsletters, digital and otherwise, in hospitals and health systems, surgery centers, orthopedics and spine then health IT and revenue cycle. And it, it was really built around niches and a great leadership team. Like many successful businesses, you know, it was built originally for a different purpose. And then I was at least paying enough attention to understand, oh, this can be a real business. And at some point it became a, a real, real business. Now has, you know, depending on what day it is, you know, not huge, but 70 to 80 employees has six major conferences a year. Of course, the conference has been shelved for the last year or two. Um, and then, you know, tons of different digital properties. Um, and and has and is just been a um, great fun and a labor of love and, and, and successful as well. It's been, it's been really fantastic. But while I was building the media company, I was also practicing law and building client base, building teams. And, and I guess some of the lessons that come out of all of it is, it's very hard to do anything significant without great people and great teams. Like I'm a huge subscriber to the old Jim Collins, good to great concept of everything comes with, you know, first and foremost, great people and great teams, and then clarifying strategy and what you're trying to do. But, but that was sort of the genesis of the media company called Becker's healthcare, you know, and it's, um, We've got great leadership there and the CEO, Jessica Cole, the editorial teams, the leadership teams, the sales teams, key account management teams, events teams, and so forth. So it's been just a great, uh, 
a great pleasure. And it's, given me, and it's given me a chance to interact with everybody from top CEOs in healthcare to presidents and athletes and so forth that we use as keynote speakers for our events. And, it, and it's really been a great, great experience in so many ways. Hey, Jeremy, let me turn it back to you before I Yeah, I'm going to, um, <clears throat> I want to dig into some of the things that have stuck out uh, with some of these keynote speakers, but I wanted to just ask for a second and, and I don't know what, what website we should point people towards. I know um, there is um, ASCcommunications.com where you can see kind of Becker's health care. They have the ASC review, hospital review, spine review, dental plus DSO review, clinical leadership and infection control. Are there any other places we should, what other places should we send them online um, to check out more? No, thank you. I mean, the, the easiest place to do is to go to, if you just Google Becker's Healthcare or Becker's Hospital Review, Becker's Hospital is really the flagship property uh, yeah. within the Becker's Healthcare Media business. And so Becker's Hospital Review, you know, is, is the easiest place to go. And then there are a lot of other um, secondary or offshoot properties and so forth. But the, 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 the sort of banner or flagship is Becker's Hospital Review. Yeah. It, it would go to that. Got it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm on Becker's hospital review.com. You could check it out. And on the top, you could see all those, all those pieces, hospital, spine, clinical health, it CFO, dental plus DSO and everything else. So check that out. Um, you know, <clears throat> what's interesting is you saw some originally you go, you want to build this amazing book of bill business, be invaluable to whatever firm you're a part of, build your own firm. And what comes out of it is something that you're like, this is an actual separate business. At what point did you realize that? What was the traction you were seeing? They go, I need to get a whole, um, because again, like a lot of <clears throat> lawyers, they're maybe working 60, 80, a hundred hours a week. They don't have any time to build a separate business, let alone, you know, the business that they're doing. So I'd love to hear how you can manage all that. But when did you first see there's something else here that I need to, build something around so so this was a this is a great question this is a great question there was an aha moment quite frankly so the the business was going fine it was going well it was really built around a couple newsletters and a couple conferences for literally 10 to 15 years there was a point in time where it was just naturally we outsourced everything in the business i was still a lawyer and still am at a, at a major major law firm a great law firm and you know it's we i was outsourcing everything to a company that was doing you know, running the meetings, helping me run the newsletter. And I was sort of the chief content officer, which is really the role I still have today. And, and it, it became clear people were asking to buy more stuff from us, to do more stuff with us. And we just didn't really have the team or capacity to do it. So that was one part of it. Mm. But a bigger part of it was, you know, I'm always an avid reader and, and was reading, you know, one day about Comdex, which so is just the consumer, you know, electronic show. And, and the Consumer Electronics Show ended up being, you know, a $900 million property or some crazy number. And it was the really the beginning of the fortunes for, you know, one of these guys and who ended up being a casino magnet and all those kinds of things, too. And I was like, wow, this could actually be a real business, not just sort of like illegal marketing thing, not just sort of whatever. And because the business was already making money, I was able to start. And it's not that I had aspirations like that. But it was an aha moment that this is actually a real business, not just not just something that makes some money and helps me build build a legal brand, but a real business. And at that point, I sort of decided I had to make a choice. Am I going to keep on outsourcing everything, or am I going to start building a team around it? Hmm. And then there were a number of you know fortunate things that happened in starting to build a team, you know that that sort of emerged. You know the the, the most valuable employee ended up being a person who's my CEO and partner today, who was the niece of a client, you know, I was looking for some help. I was looking for people for internships, for help, just trying to start to figure this out as a real business versus outsourcing everything. And she came to work with me when she was in college and was so far ahead of all the people I had hired that within several years, she became, you know, chief of sales and chief executive officer and was just a real big part of the success of the company because was able to take sort of what I'd done on the content sides and, and build teams and commercialize it in a different way and so forth. But there were, there were different aha moments. There was, you know, we're making some money. We start to read about people in this conference business that make real money. And then we started to hire people 
And it was, um, you know, it, it, you know, ultimately so much of everything comes down to, are you in the right place and do you have the right people? So we, we ultimately at some point ended up for some period of time in the right place with the right people. We're able to grow significantly. And we then, you know, it, we're, you know, we, you know, we made a lot of decisions, enough good ones versus bad ones. I mean, plenty of bad ones, but some of the good ones were, we really focused on digital events. We really focused on outsourcing everything but our core competencies. There, there were a number of decisions that we made. You know, we, we, we didn't put too much ego into it. There was, there's a magnificent competitor in our business that has the leading print magazine. And we were able to early on decide, we can't fight that. We have to try and win digitally, not in print, because we just couldn't afford it. And we didn't want to take an ounce of capital on those kinds of things. We really, and we studied some other things and we came to the decision, we wanted to be deep in a few areas, not, not spread so thin. And so we made some good decisions, we made some bad decisions, but there was an aha moment where we decided we could build a team, we can go after this, this could be fun. And, and it was really interesting, but there, there were some of those aha moments. It's a great question. And sorry for blabbering on Jeremy. No, I love that. <clears throat> and it's like, you actually, a big shift is you actually just decided. I mean, you saw this could be something and you saw the opportunity. And that's what I love about listening to other podcasts or reading books. It just gives you a frame like everyone, I mean, almost everyone started from scratch or somewhat near scratch and they turned it into something and you saw, wow, well, if, you know, if anyone, I, th- I don't know how much square footage the consumer electronics show takes up, but it's, it's huge. I mean, all the biggest companies, a lot of the biggest companies electronically in the world are there. And it's like, well, you know, they started from that. I can do that too. And then you built a team around it. And um, I'd love to hear, how did you decide and you saw, okay, there's maybe some spaces that were taken over and what does winning digitally look like? So you're like, well, there's people who have these print magazines. We're not going to compete there. What did you decide your core competency was going to be? And then I would love to hear about winning digitally. So what what happened was, so when we really got going in earnest, there's this magnificent Cranes Communication publication called Modern Healthcare. And they had a weekly forever, and they were sort of the leader in weekly print publications. And a weekly print publication to put out, extremely expensive, extremely, you know, people intensive and, and, and just, just very, it's a real, real thing. And they had magnificent advertising in it. And they were built by the Cranes families, whole family publications, but a great publication in healthcare. And we decided at some point that we couldn't, you know, win against them there. I just couldn't afford it, quite frankly, amongst all other things. And so we chose that we would try and be the most sort of viewed website and the most read emails digitally in terms of a digital publication. Digital publication meant, you know, a very, very busy website, uh, very, very busy digital newsletters that get read a lot. And then ultimately ended up in the events business too and destination conferences. Our conferences were never really Comdex, but, you know, conferences when they're going well, five, 10,000 people would come to them, you know, and we, we would attract a lot of the top leaders in the healthcare sector to speak at them and, and, and then great sponsor and advertiser support for them. But winning digitally was, was what really came down to is our website, the most read website in the business or not. And, you know, for the business of healthcare, and that's really what we aimed at and where we got to. And it was a fascinating sort of development and a lot of, a lot of thinking, building a great editorial team. We've got, I think, 25 full-time writers led by Molly Gamble and then Ayla Ellison and Laura Durda, magnificent editorial team, but, but literally building a, a, an editorial team and really focusing on how do we win digitally. And this was, again, 15, 17 years ago, it, it, it's a much harder thing to start today and do today with, with limited resources. Today, you need massive resources to do this because you know, there's just so much digital traffic, digital overflow, digital everything. But at the time, there wasn't that focus. So we were able to build significant digital properties with great editorial teams and great distributions. So that's what digital winning looks like. Are you the busiest website in your area? Do people follow your website? Do they look at it constantly? Do, do they have a reason to, are they getting the news they need to do whatever they do? And that's what winning digitally looked like. How do, Scott, you know, who are ideal to be viewing Becker's hospital review? Dot com and all the assets. Um, and then I'd love to hear how people engage 
can engage with you, whether it's free or paid? Because I know you have a lot of new e-newsletters people can sign up for. Yeah. You have physical conferences. Talk about some of the who's who should be going to your site. You know, if someone so, knows of someone or someone is someone should be going to your site. And then no, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you've asked three or four magnificent questions there. So first, all the the websites and the electronic distribution is all free. It was one of the decisions we made a long time ago that we wouldn't have a paywall and that's how we would win having the amount of people reading our websites, reading our electronic newsletters and so forth. So it's all the electronic stuff is free. And so we made a bet a long time ago that we had to live or die with our advertisers, our sponsors and so forth because the advertisers and sponsors are what of course allows us to keep the lights on to make it all work. But, but everything is free. So if you go to Becker's Healthcare, you can go to the website and go to the website as many times as you want to. You can go to the newsletter, you can sign up for the newsletter as many times as you want to. And it's all, you know, it's all, it's all free. Now, the focus of the newsletter is the business of healthcare, really. And so if you're the people that read it, the target audience are hospital executives, hospital leaders, hospital nurse managers, hospital chief executive officers, hospital CFOs, whatever. And we have different lines for each of those, but within the hospital sector, it'd be chief information officer, chief operating officer, but, but hospital leadership, we have other physician lines, orthopedic and spine, where for example, the, the reader would be an orthopedic physician, a spine surgeon, whoever it might be. We have gastroenterology, we have a number of other lines, but, but the big lines our hospital and health systems, health IT and revenue cycle, surgery centers, orthopedics and spine. The, um, and the readers are sort of the, you know, people leading in those areas. And then the advertisers and sponsors are people that need to reach those people. And that's the core of it. Um, we, we already talked about no paywalls and that's how we, one of the things that helped us really grow our audience. Uh, we've talked about who the readership is, and then anybody who wants to subscribe or wants to reach me can, can always find me. I mean, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. I respond. Anybody messages me, we respond almost immediately. Um, people can text me. It, 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 it's easy to find me. So the other ways people, th that's great. Um, other ways people can engage so they can sign up for the free newsletters. Um, you also have in-person and virtual conferences too. <laughs> Yes, right. we have we have traditionally very, very large in-person conferences. We have six large in-person conferences a year. Those are, of course, right now, um, you know, it's uh, touch and go. We just had to move our September conference, which is a health IT conference, uh, where both um, God, Shaquille O'Neal was speaking, as well as Nikki Haley was speaking, and uh, Howard Dean was speaking. We just had to move that to virtual, just based on the growth of the Delta variant right now, and what's happened with COVID-19 and so forth. Uh, we're still touching on our October, November conferences. Those conferences, people could find on our websites and attend in person. Um, you know, it, and so that. It should That's just be that. in person, Scott. It's like BYOHS, bring your own hazmat suit. Everyone just, you know, I mean, they probably have access to them. You know, everyone just brings a hazmat suit and uh, you go, you have an in-person conference. A hundred percent. So we, we, we like, so some conferences are still going on. They hit this window between things really opening up and now getting a little tighter again. And some conferences will continue to go on where, you know, require everybody to be vaccinated, show a, pot, a negative COVID test. And we could do that. We've got the challenge of, you know, so many hospitals and health systems, which are the core tens of our conferences are, you know, we're, are overwhelmed with COVID yeah, cases. They're overloaded. And so, yeah. so if we end up having a conference and we add to that problem versus yeah. help that problem, it yeah. becomes sort of like it not being a good citizen in our industry and we live in our industry. Yeah. And so it is what it is. I could see that. Yeah. They're and, overwhelmed. And we have to make sure. And, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we have to make sure our, 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 you know, we, we have, we have, you know, three or four core constituents. One is that hospital audience of health system leaders. Two is our vendors and advertisers, you know, and, and, and you know, and, and three is our team. And, and ultimately, we got to come down to what works for all of those constituencies every time. And so at this point in time, we're moving our September conference to virtual and, and all terrific, all good. I mean, all, all good and they'll be fine. I mean, we, we miss being in person, but it's all good. Talk about some past speakers. Um, you mentioned we mentioned if presidents. We mentioned Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, you've had the the chance to interview um, these people um, on stage. Uh, who are some of the 
you know, people that stick out and, and maybe some of the lessons learned? Sure. And so there are, you know, what, one of the things you find amongst all of these speakers, whether it's uh, President Clinton, President Bush, Hillary Clinton, Nikki Haley, Venus Williams, Bill Walton, we've had just tons of celebrities, Tucker Carlson, is that that um, all of these speakers have tremendous personal skills. They, they generally don't get to where they are without having tremendous personal skills. And there will be people that you might have come up with your own narrative in your own mind about based on what you listen to on TV, what you listen to in person and, and what you, you know, what you've heard and what you find when you meet almost all of these people almost entirely as they, they are just a pleasure to be with. And that's partly how they've become so successful. So if you, you know, if you start out in a, a centrist household and thought Hillary was difficult or Hillary was this, when you visit with Hillary Clinton, you find that she is just a absolute pleasure to be with as a person. You know, it's like unexpectedly a pleasure. Like you would, you know, if you're going to have somebody over for dinner, I mean, not to, not to, you, you, you'd almost prefer Hillary to Bill because she's just as a pleasure to be with, just like a very nice, warm, pleasant person. And you see why she was so well liked and became so well respected and everything. You know, you, you meet, um, you know, you, 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 meet people like, oh, goodness. And I know, I, I, you know, George Bush, also just an absolute pleasure of a person, just a pleasure to be with. Um, you know, uh, Nikki Haley, uh, terrific leader, what have you, but sounds like she's talking always from talking points versus like having a conversation with you. Uh, people like Tucker Carlson, not with saying the narrative on TV, a pleasure to be with and a more balanced thinker than what you get on TV. And so you'd find like Tucker doesn't quite meet the mold that you see on TV. Hillary for sure doesn't. It's just an absolute pleasure to be with. Then people like Bill Walton, you know, mm. you know, what you know, was he like? Schwarzenegger. Bill Walton just is like a fascinating, fascinating, you know, person. You, you, mm. you know, many of these people are paid for a speech and mm -hmm. they're paid to come. I mean, they're all paid to come and they're all paid to be there. And then some of them, the moment they're done are gone and we learned years ago, you have to pay for them also to walk the exhibit hall, to, to visit and do pictures with your customers and your, you know, your VIPs and all those things. But some of them, regardless whether you're paying or not, for the extras, will just give 100%. Mm. So Bill Walton is like that. Sugar Ray Leonard is like that. You, you pay them and they stay for hours when they don't, when they're not required to. They're just, mm. they're just, they give you so much value. They try so hard. They're, they're, they're just... And, and people enjoy being with them because they enjoy being there. Um, you know, we, we've, we've had so many different speakers. Um, I, obviously, it's a highlight for me to get to interview uh, Bill Clinton, uh, George Bush, uh, Hillary Clinton and others. And some of our great editorial leaders have had the chance to do that as well. It just what, what strikes me is the overwhelming sort of like, you know, personal talents of these people. I mean, you can't you, you, you understand if you visit with so many of them. Oh got it i could see why mm. people that you know what you see something different than you just see on tv where they're painting this as a narrative by whoever you watch fox or cnn or whatever it is or msnbc whatever it is that you watch but in person many of them are just normal they're normal people that have been highly successful and many of them feel very much like normal people some of them feel like they're still operating still on the make but most don't most feel like they're just a you know like it, it unusual pleasure to be with but there's a reason they've got crazy personal skills. I, I enjoyed visiting with Venus Williams almost as much as anybody like hmm. in person was tremendously humble, a little anxious, a little nervous at first. And they're just an absolute pleasure to be with. I mean, just, it, you know, hmm. but you see so much of that, you know, like it's I don't wild know, to like think that, right. That it's someone so top of their game and world that they can be so humble and, and somewhat nervous, right? Because they've been in just pressure situations. Yes. And some of them are so good at this. Like George Bush is so good. It's like he makes sure that whoever's interviewing sits down with them before. And he doesn't do it to make sure he's comfortable. He does it more to make sure the interview is going to be comfortable. You know, sometimes mm. we have, you know, you know, you know, you know, different people interviewing and they just are very, very thoughtful in how they handle it. And some more, it's just, you're just doing like, I remember originally the first time we had Bobby Knight, 
Bobby Knight has spoken for us a few different times now, but the first time he came, he spoke for 40 minutes. We asked him to walk the exhibit hall and he's like, I'm not in my contract, you know, and so I'm not doing it. But then five, seven years later, he had mellowed some and was just an mm -hmm. absolute pleasure. And it was just a pleasure. And like, uh, right. you know, w would call before from the golf course, say, Scott, what are we talking about? What are we going to do? And just a total pleasure. And then, you know, you saw a softer side of him. We were on a panel one time with him and Mike Ditka, Coach Ditka. And Coach Ditka, you know, it's, it, it, uh, unfortunately, we've seen Coach Ditka recently. It's very hard for him. He's not, he's not nearly as sharp as he was. He's got, you know, whether dementia or Alzheimer's or challenges. Um, and, and Bobby Knight, you know, constantly went out of his way on a panel with the two of them to try and make coach Ditko look good, you know, to make him feel good and look good. Mm. And you see a totally different part of Bobby Knight than many people have seen on TV or I saw originally. And that was just fascinating. Bobby Knight, so it's so he's so past the time at which people are, but Bobby Knight was the original sort of the general, he was called, you know, a cheer throwing coach, like of the old school. And you saw him very humanized in person and you see, you know, you see that with a lot of people that have been made into characters on TV, like Hillary's been made into a character by certain stations. You meet her in person. You could not visit with a nicer person. You know, Tucker Carlson, sort of a character on TV. You meet him in person and we've, you know, you could, it's hard to visit with a nicer person. And I know he's playing a role now and stuff like that. And Hillary plays a role of bashing the Republicans. You know, Tucker plays a role of bashing the Democrats, but in person, they're much more balanced. And, mm. and it's, it's fascinating to watch that as well. I'd love to hear too. Um, thanks for sharing those. Some of your um, your mentors in the industry or colleagues that you respect in some lessons, because I know we have a few more minutes, but um, uh, I do want to point people towards Becker's hospital review.com. They could check out more. And it's amazing to hear some of the speakers you've had. Cause I remember, you know, one of my favorite, my, my favorite books are by John Wooden on leadership and sports and, you know, a lot of the audible version, some of the beginning part is read by Bill Walton, who was one of the players under John Wooden. And uh, just so I'm sure you have some just treasure trove of um, information and speakers and sessions on the website. So people should check it out. Um, from your perspective, Scott, um, who are some of the, the mentors or colleagues that, that stick out to you? Um, through your journey? Sure. So it, it, there's really three different people from three different places that had given me sort of great advice at, at different points. And, you know, I it, it could go through a bunch of them, but there was a gentleman who ran the department that I was in at the law firm who was very big on building niche businesses, niche practices, and that appealed to me. So sort of followed that lead in building originally my original healthcare practice around a niche. The, the, the second person, and, and I'll go through four very quickly, had great influence on me, was a, was a young lawyer who worked for me named Marcelo Corpus. And when I was a young lawyer, you know, the, the way of these big law firms is if you wanted to get something done, you, you were sort of harsh or very direct to the people that were junior to you. And, and, it, and, and it was... Um, I was probably five years out of school, but I was, of course, how it works in these law firms. I was bossing around a person who was two, three years out of school, and I yelled at a different person. And Marcelo took me aside. He was a young lawyer at the time and said to me, you know, when you yell at somebody, it might help for this moment, but it creates a cancer in the organization in the long term. So it affects not just that person. It affects everybody else. And, and it was so inspirational to me and so informative to me that I, I basically got yelling and bossing out of my repertoire. Now it's about 30, 25, 27, 30 years ago, but it was, it was, it was life-changing for me. It was literally in a moment I was able to change how I dealt with people and realized the, 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 and, 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 and not that I'm always perfect, but it completely took me out of that way of managing or trying to get things done for the rest of my career. And it's, it was just inspirational and mm -hmm. telling for me. And it took the courage of this young lawyer to tell me, this is really bad behavior and it's bad for all of us, Scott. It's not just, it, maybe it gets us done today for the client, but it's bad for all of us in the long term of building the team you want to build. And it was really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. the, the third person is a guy, Jerry Peters, who's a lawyer at a different firm. And when I was trying to build a practice, he was very clear to me, like Jim Collins says about good to great, that everything is about building great teams. There's, it's, it's, it's impossible to do anything serious without great teams. And, and Jerry Peters sat me down and gave me that advice. You know, there were, there were other people as well that were very inspirational. Of course, you know, mom and dad have been magnificent. Um, 
you know, my, you know, in, in terms of encouraging and so forth. Then there was a vice chancellor of student affairs at U of I who was, you know, when I went through some challenging times, was very, very helpful to me in sort of thinking through how we rebounded resiliency and so forth. A guy named Stan Levy and was was very helpful to me in a, in a, in a million ways in terms of mentoring me and thinking through things and so forth. So th- those are four of the people that had specific direct influences on me. This guy, Bob Pristay from the law firm, Marcella Corpus. Um, you know, there, there was a woman, Yvette Harmon, who's also a driven, driven, terrific leader at our law firm. Marcella Corpus and Jerry Peters were all really helpful. And then Stan Levy from, you know, when I was um, in, in college and then throughout life has been helpful to me in terms of just thinking through things and approaching things and resilience and so forth. But those are some of the mentors that have been really helpful to me. Amazing. Scott, first of all, thank you. I know you're a very busy man. You're running all these uh, entities. Um, so I just want to thank you for sharing your lessons, your knowledge, your stories. Everyone should go to Becker's hospital review.com. Check out more their e-newsletters. They have, they have a nu- the same number of e-newsletters. They have podcasts. So check out their podcast. They have a treasure trove of podcast episodes too. And they have a link to the podcast on the Becker's hospital review.com that and many more check it out. Um, thank you so much, Scott. Really appreciate you. Jeremy, just a pleasure to visit with you. Thanks so much for having me on. And what a great job you do and what you do. What a, what a pleasure to visit with you. Thank you very much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.